lot of times we believe that the past is behind us when in fact the past is on the side of us holding us as we walk into the future. The famous painted ladies of San Francisco that were once part of the black community. Um, I was a singer in a local singing group opening for Fats Domino and all that. But to celebrate the most important thing, and that is community. Yes. Community coming together. I was tremendously impacted when I picked up the Jet magazine and saw that mutilated head. Being a living example of love, how to stand for community, and I'm just honored that we get to stand in your legacy and continue this evening. I'm Omari D. Uh, Hamilton, most people call me Rico. Uh, Omari D is my name that my grandmother gave me, which means Royal Prince. Uh, and that is me in totality. Um, I try my best to walk in that integrity of being a Royal Prince. Um, I'm also, uh, I'm also black history, um, which means that I try to walk in the footsteps of those who came before me and having a sense of integrity and making sure I'm conscientious of all that I do so that I can be a proper representation of uh, my people. Uh, my biggest dream, and I have a lot of dreams for Black San Francisco, um, but my biggest dream is uh, being able to unite as one um, and becoming a group that really represents um, what we stand for, which is rich heritage, um, which is love, compassion, empathy, um, and us all really walking in that. Um, and being able to um, stand up for each other, to love each other, um, to hold hands and to dream together, um, to create an economic base where we create a foundation for um, Black people to rise above uh, oppression and, and other things that has happened to us. Um, but it's going to take all of us um, to be able to achieve some of these goals. Um, and that's my biggest dream for Black San Francisco is to really hone in on economics and being able to create a foundation of economics. And we know that that starts with um, property. It starts with um, home ownership. It starts with businesses um, and being able to educate our young people around uh finances. One thing is, and, and I know a lot of young people don't know this, uh, they don't know that Maya Angelou lived in the Western edition. Uh, Maya Angelou also was the first black woman to um, be a Charlie car driver um, here in the city of San Francisco. And I think that that's a lot of young people should know that uh, part of it. Um, also, I think that some that's not acknowledged is the rich history and the um, the rich historical value that uh, Black San Francisco has, I think that a lot of times it's talked about. And I think in acknowledging things, it's not just saying it verbally, it's really honoring it by actions and creating things to um, somehow, how do we preserve that, right? And I, and I think that um, that's a great way to acknowledge things is through uh, community preservation. And um, to me, I think that that's something that's not acknowledged is, yeah, we can talk about uh, Harlem of the West, but if there's no com uh, hist historical preservation to continue that on for our younger generations, it's really omitting, in my opinion, the, uh, the rich history around, we have around jazz, blues, um, black ownership um, and all the amazing things that black people brought here to San Francisco. I think that blacks have been has been tr has been uh, treated with a dismissive state. Um, I think that a lot of it is um, hidden and I think it's through a hidden agenda. Um, I don't think that we've been treated um, physically poorly or, or like folks have been treated in the South. But I think that um, here in San Francisco, it's a little bit more subtle. It's a little bit more um, strategic, in my opinion. I think that um, we don't get the equity that we need. I think that we need a call to action uh, around black equity um, and what does black equity mean and how do we create true inclusion?
And how do we get the city to look at its charter, its policies, and get them to admit that their policies and the charter is actually um, created and uh, and made in opposition of of, of black people, um, and give them to take real ownership of that because. Um, if we continue and don't have them take ownership, we'll continue to be in the same state because those policies is what dictate how they're governed. And we know that the way that they're governed is always in opposition of the black community. Uh, when it goes to housing, when it goes to business, as it relates to pretty much everything, I think that their policies is, uh, isn't culturally competent and uh, supportive of black people. So how do we... Uh, get them to really, really hone in or how do you get the city to hone in on those policies and say, hey, how do we make this stuff inclusion or inclusionary of the black community and other communities that are disenfranchised and underserved? People like uh, Melanie and Melora, um, people like yourself, Don, um, myself, individuals that work hard in the community to bring uh, equity, to bring education, um, to bring um, a sense of a human right um, that we all deserve to be treated equally, um, that we all deserve uh, housing, that we all deserve certain things. And I think that in 10 years, San Francisco will be heading in a great place. Uh, we have our first uh, reparation advisory board. Um, so I think San Francisco is heading in the right direction. Uh, it's just going to continue to be up to people like ourselves to continue to push and to fight for uh, the up and coming generation, um, especially educating them on who they are, educating them on some of the movements and some of the things that happened before us um, and getting them to really understand that uh, the past isn't behind us. The past is right next to us, holding us as we walk into the future. So hopefully that we can continue to, to uplift and to um, raise young people with enough resilience to want to be a part of the fight and continue to uplift their folks. Uh, all I can add is just love each other, love each other, um, love your, love your brother and sister, love your neighbor, like your brother and sister, continue to uh, uplift each other. Um, and, and, and I think that we need to, as, as a people is learn how to problem solve, you know, when there's a problem, let's, let's talk about it. Let's address the elephant in the room and let's lift each other up. from the Bay Area Mural Program, where I'm creative director. And we're working on this amazing mural for the YMCA, Marcus Books, and Rackinson. Um, it's been a dope project. Honestly, I feel like one of the things that's really special about it is just how many moving parts there are and how much teamwork it takes to accomplish this. What's up, y'all? Timothy B. And uh, I'm a muralist from Oakland. I'm currently with the Bay Area Mural Program. And I used to come here when I was in fourth grade. Used to play basketball here. I learned how to swim here. And now, you know, I'm outside of the Y painting a big image of Steph Curry, you know? It just, it's crazy how like everything just kind of come back. <laughs>
my name is Arnold Townsend, Reverend Arnold Townsend, uh, known in many circles as Reverend T, A.T., and other things that I will not mention now. San Francisco. It's pretty interesting. 1965, I was in uh, Southern California, Los Angeles, where I uh, spent most of my former years. Uh, came to LA in 1949. Uh, I was uh, started life in Oklahoma, Rennesville, Oklahoma, an all black town in Oklahoma. Oklahoma at one time had 28 all black towns. And conventional wisdom says that had he not uh, been assassinated, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln was uh, on the verge of making Oklahoma a black state, which uh, I regret it didn't happen. It would have been interesting if you think about uh, places like Greenwood, and Greenwood wasn't the only successful black uh, town in the United States, not even the only successful one in Oklahoma. Um, it was a section of Tulsa. It would have been interesting as a black state because while not every black person would have lived there, we would have all had connection there. I'm certain it would have been sort of a mecca for black Americans and that uh, we would have all had connections and relatives or even owned uh, businesses or investments there. And uh, I'm certain that it would have been successful, so successful, we would have been invaded three or four times by now by the surrounding uh, white communities. But uh, it's a tragedy, it didn't happen. Uh, I, I think the history of this country the racial history of this country might have been a lot different had we had a place that we controlled and that we controlled the economics. So, uh, but anyway, we left the farm in 49 and came to California. I was living with my grandparents. My parents were already here. So I did most of all of my schooling in Los Angeles until I was 18 and left LA to go outside 35 miles, to go to college. Um, quite frankly, to be honest, I only went to college if, uh, when I first went was to play baseball. Right? And I wanted to go to a good baseball school. And that's what I did. I dropped out trying to sign a contract, a pro contract. And because I dropped out, it was Vietnam time. So in 1965, I was drafted. Went in the Army and uh, uh, the first, no, in November, and the first year, I was uh, drafted uh, the first year. I did my training. I stayed in Colorado for a year. And Colorado was the coldest place in the world, I thought, until the next November, and I was sent to Korea. It was during Vietnam, but I went to Korea. Good news about Korea at that time. They didn't shoot at you every day. Things happened, but things didn't happen to me, and I'm grateful for that. So I came. And I met a guy in the Army, and I was trying to decide where I wanted to go to school because I knew I had to go to school and maybe take it a little more seriously this time. And I wanted to give baseball one more shot. That never happened, but I did go to San Francisco State because a friend of mine I met in the Army uh, was a grad student at State. And when he got out earlier than I did, he remembered that the one thing that we 
thirsted for in the army was literature. You could find doggerel, you know, uh, books that, you know, about the Wild West and war books and other kinds of novels, but not any real literature was hard to find. And he would send me magazines, books, and he would send me publications. And he sent me some publications from San Francisco State. They had a literary magazine at the time called Open Process. And I wanted to be a writer, I thought at that time, only because I was so deeply into James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, County Cullen, black authors, that I really was interested. And so uh, I went to, I ended up at State College. That's how I got to San Francisco. San Francisco, summer of 67, uh, the summer of love. I got here in September. And uh, I thought San Francisco was a wonderful place. And quite frankly, it was at that time. Uh, got here, you know, one of the first places you head because you've heard about it. I had been to San Francisco before uh, I got drafted, so I knew about it. And I had dead to Fillmore Street. Uh, and it was <laughs> wonderful, uh, uh, if, if I could say so. Nightclubs and restaurants, but just the life that occurred on the streets of San Francisco, on the streets of Fillmore. I heard uh, an older gentleman tell a young brother before the, uh, I guess it was right before the pandemic jumped off, they were talking about something. And he said, son, I remember when you used to have to walk down Fillmore Street sideways because there were so many people on the street, you couldn't walk full of breath. I remember that when I got here. Um, uh, and, and, and I think, one of the things that happened, and one of the mistakes, is we let our community get labeled a poor community. And what I mean by that is that's only a part of the story. Certainly, uh, being a black community, we had poor people in it. Certainly, we had more than our share. But nobody talked about the successful people that were in our community. Nobody talked about the businesses that employed hundreds, if not black owned businesses, that employed hundreds, if not thousands of folks. And that was all over the country at that time. Black people were working. And, and because we were working in the 50s and 60s, uh, uh, the, you could open businesses and you could own businesses and you could have that. And, and not every business was black owned on Fillmore Street, but there were enough businesses in between the Japanese the uh, uh, white, mostly Jewish-owned businesses and, and, and other Asian businesses uh, on the street, that people were successful. We had, <clears throat> when, when I was uh, uh, working in community organizations, when we got ready to get our insurance, we never did business with white insurance brokers, only black ones. All of the, almost all the business we did was with uh, black business folk. And even when I was uh, the, the director of the Western Edition Project Area Committee, WAPAC, we, our bank was Bank of America on Fillmore and uh, Geary. Uh, uh, no, Fillmore and Polk, excuse me. But the reality is the, the, the manager when we first went there was an African brother. Later on, uh, he m moved on, and we got a new manager who was white but extremely supportive of us and what we did in the community. That's the kind of um, activity that was going on on Fillmore Street. And, and, and it was impressive. It was impressive for me. And we have to understand that what happened with urban renewal, redevelopment, uh, uh, they call it urban renewal, we call it Negro removal, is that um, what was destroyed and broken up, first of all, they did, declared eminent domain on properties. That meant the government comes in, tells you we're taking your property. This is what we've deemed it's worth, and they give it to you. You give you that money, and you got to go if you own it. What you got to remember about that is, and never forget, they took our wealth, excuse me, and gave us money for it. It's not the same thing. And then there was nothing else around that you could reinvest that money no other wealth around. There was no other business district. If you went somewhere else, 
You were alone on an island, the only black business there. Uh, many went to Oakland and others just folded up, waiting for urban renewal to come back. You gave, they, they were given certificates, said they would have the first right to come back, but then you didn't build anything commercial for over 20 years for them to come back to. Different patterns were established by then. You either locate, relocated your business somewhere else or you were out of business or you were dead or retired. Uh, and and it, it was a vicious thing to have done to a people. And we suffered. I think one of the other things that nobody talks about is I believe the destruction of uh, the Fillmore uh, community destroyed probably at that time maybe one of the most if not the most uh progressive progressive voting blocks voting districts in the united states a lot of radical activity um uh was was born right here in this community uh certainly while the black panther party was born in oakland certainly one of its most active and successful and largest chapters was right here on Fillmore Street. And we were at San Francisco State in the BSU at that time, and we were basically Black Panther Party affiliates. Uh, they were on campus frequently using our offices and our phones. We worked together with them whenever they had a, a, a mobilization. They called us and we put on our leathers and our berets or whatever you're wearing, and we showed up. And, and we all uh, worked together in this community. And it was ama an amazing struggle. And, you know, I, I, I think, look back and I think about that time, and I think about J. Edgar Hoover, who's the director of the FBI, when asked, um, uh, what is the greatest threat to the United States of America? And he said, black radicals. Black ra and you know, that statement at the same at the time seemed overwhelming because uh we were youngsters we were kids but i think we didn't understand but he did uh, uh the concept of arab spring that the protests in america led by black radicalism had gotten so strong and so uh, uh prevalent all over the nation that had it kept growing there, there, would, there may have been need for real fundamental change to keep it going, and they set out to stop that. And I, I'll tell you something that's interesting that I hadn't really talked about before. We, I was invited to a meeting one Saturday morning, and we were meeting with some people that wanted to talk to us at the off-campus center on, uh, here in the Fillmore, the BSU off-campus center, and there had been a fire. So there was water all of inches of water all over the floors had burned out. And the only dry place was on the roof. And we met with these people on the roof. And it was William F. Buckley from uh, was a Nation magazine, whatever his magazine was, a conservative news magazine weekly, uh, like Time and Newsweek. And then the editor publishers of Time, Newsweek, and several other publications wanted to meet with us. And we met with them. And the results, I remember reading the articles they wrote afterwards, and one of them said, these young people are not your children who are armchair revolutionary. They're not middle class kids playing at revolution. They are serious. And right after that was when all the killings of, of murders of Panthers and other radicals really got underway. And we found out later on when a friend of ours did his... Uh, 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 He's deceased now, but he did his Freedom of Information Act and found out that we had no, you know, we knew the FBI and those people were around, but we had no idea. We were un under surveillance by all the uh, intelligence divisions of all the military services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, all of them were investigating us or surveilling us at any one time. And, and that's because there had been a blending of the hate street and, you know, a lot of radicals, and they called them hippies. The, but the hate Ashbury neighborhood, which was also very black at that time, not now, but very black at that time, 
And, and in fact, many of the people who live in areas like that, north of Panhandle, uh, who, who are anti-gentrification, were the first gentrifiers of neighborhoods where we used to live. Uh, and, and that doesn't make them wrong, but they ought to at least be aware of what they did. They started it, the gentrification that has overwhelmed San Francisco now at this point, and now that it's uh, taken care of in large measure of the black community, is now starting on other communities. Um, and, and I find that uh, fascinating because it doesn't stop. That's why it's such a terrible thing when it starts. So San Francisco has been a place that, uh, that pioneered free expression uh, and not so much now. I tell people that when I got to San Francisco, it was not like it was uh, some liberal radical uh, pioneer. There were Republicans in office when I got here. But it was a town where people uniquely minded their own business, which I think is a hell of a good way to live your life when you got neighbors. And it's not that kind of town now. I mean, we live in a town now where some people think you ought to have to go to their neighborhood association before you rearrange your furniture in your living room. I mean, it's, it's absolutely absurd um, of what is happening to this city now in many regards. There are two components. One, I, I just told you that the redevelopment agency declared eminent domain within the redevelopment area. The redevelopment area was a defined, defined designated area of a certain number of blocks, uh, loosely from Post, Sutter North, Sutter North to, um, uh, let's see, maybe Fulton, yeah, maybe Fulton South. Uh, roughly uh, Van Esch, East, uh, and uh, Roderick, uh, the Visitero, almost to the Visitero. Um, probably Steiner. Uh, that was redevelopment re loosely. You, you know, there were uh, turns, the twists and turns in it, but that was it loosely. And so there, they, if they wanted your property, they declared eminent, eminent domain, domain. But there was property outside of that area that was also the Fillmore, the Western Edition. What they did there is banks, Wells Fargo, Bank of America chiefly, that redlined our communities. What redlining means is, is they don't give loans to that, to that neighborhood, and certainly they don't give black people loans. Well, part of the problem with that is, for most of us in this country, the most valuable thing we ever own, if we're able to get one, is a home. It's our wealth base. Everything comes out of the home. Many times if you own a home, when your children get grown and they want to buy a home and they need a down payment, well, the down payment is 20%. So uh, on a $200,000 home, 400, that's $40,000. Where do we get that? You go to the bank and you take a second on the equity in your, in your home, your parents own, and they loan that to you for your down payment and you pay them back. That's the way, or you wait until you get that much equity in your home and you take out a second, you pay them back. But that's, and a lot of times they may not want it back or they love their children. They, you know, whatever the case is, that's how it happens. And so, or if you need a roofing job, you know, it's raining, it's going to destroy your property. That's the most valuable thing your family owns. That's the basis of your family wealth. You got to get it fixed, but the bank won't give you a loan to get it fixed. Ultimately, you have to sell it or lose everything your family owns. So you sell it and move somewhere else. That's how they got the property outside. I'll tell you one of the most interesting things happened. Uh, Ms. Leola King, who was an entrepreneur, a businesswoman par excellence in the Fillmore community, uh, she passed some years ago. 
not many, maybe four or five years ago, in her 90s. And former Mayor Willie Brown was at her funeral service, and when he had remarks, he stood up and talked about the old days, and when he met her and said, I remember when every one of the painted ladies was owned by a black family. Uh, you know, now for those who don't know, the painted ladies are those buildings, you know, when the show Full House opens up and they show those houses by the park, those are the painted ladies. And I think we'll go this way, give you a different perspective on, especially on those buildings over there once we get out here. There's a heck of a view. There you go. So all this in here, these are all the painted ladies. There was a period of time in the 70s when they were really garishly painted, bright, uh, what, what they called at that time, bright hippie colors. Uh, they're they're more, more muted and subdued now. Uh, during uh, nowadays, but at one time they were very, very loudly painted. The full house house is a painted lady house. Black folk used to live in all of those places at one time. And those are the kind of properties. Redevelopment took many of those properties and said, we're going to tear them down. Then people started crying about them uh, tearing down uh, those beautiful Victorians. They changed their mind, but they did not offer them back to the former owners. They sold them to new white people to be, re, you know, uh, refurbished and, and, and uh, rehabilitated. And they became uh, members of this community. But the family that owned them once, who had been given the money and could have bought them back. And basically, they were sold for pennies on the dollar to these new people who now own buildings that are worth millions of dollars. And when I say millions, I'm not just talking about two or three, seven, eight, nine, some of the multi-unit dwelling units uh, that people were lied to about tearing them down and then they did not. My dream for black San Francisco right now is that the community will in large measure get involved in its own salvation that if any black presence is going to be maintained in this community, it's going to take work, it's going to take activism, it's going to take lawsuits. One of the things about the old folks, of which I am one now, uh, back in the early days of urban renewal, one thing we could do was walk and chew gum at the same time to stop much of the destruction, though it was very late in the process, People laid down in front of bulldozers. They protested. They picketed. But at the same time, they didn't take it as an either or either or situation. At the same time, they were protesting. They were going to court. They got lawyers. They sued the city and the redevelopment agency. And because of that lawsuit, where we stand now, across from us, is Banneker Homes, a 236 housing development behind us is Friendship Village, another one of those kind of developments down the block, Amo Park on one side, Lauren Miller on the other. These places were built as replacement housing. When redevelopment came, there was no replacement housing in the picture. You were moved out, your family was given $50 if you didn't own and you were renters and goodbye. But when they went to court, the court said, no, you gotta build replacement housing. And not for that lawsuit, it wouldn't be the few black folks in Filmo that you see now. The plan was to do it. The one thing I want to tell you is that black folks, if we're going to be successful, we have to have a long range view that the work we do now, the benefits may go to our children and grandchildren or your children and grandchildren. Mine are old already, but that's what may, because see, the view for the white people to reclaim Fillmore was like this. When we came, were invited out here to work in the war industry, the people who ran the city, they called city fathers, and they were fathers then because there wasn't no women involved. 
and no black folk. The city fathers assumed when the war was over, we'd all go back south. To what? More racism, more discrimination? People stayed here and started buying property. So in 1948, the Redevelopment Agency Commission was started. They didn't realize the fruits of the planning to well into the late 60s, 70s, and even today. But they started because they had a long view. And if we're going to be successful in remaining a presence, we have to have a long view. So the first thing I want us to do is adopt a long view. The second thing I think the black community has to do after they accept the long view is work. They have to become activated. I didn't say activists. They have to become activated uh, around there and, and be sure that their own success, their own freedom is in their hands. They're the only ones that can determine, determine if that's going to happen or not. They have and they're going to have to have because they need allies. But they, black folks, have to make the decisions about the black community. And that's what it's going to take. And then they can't get tired. And they can't give up. And, it, and, and I believe it can happen. But you know, of course, I'm a Christian preacher. And the reason I believe in uh, uh, that we win, ultimately, because I've looked in the book and I read the last chapter first. Whenever you're reading a book, unless it's a mystery novel, always read the last chapter first because that's where the author tells you that they proved their case. Now when you go back and start reading it, you can read it to see if that's what they really proved. But always read the last chapter. I read the last chapter. We will be successful unless we destroy ourselves, unless we destroy our own opportunities for success. And that happens if we have a refusal to work together. One of the reasons that there has been a difficulty for black people, including Juneteenth, to be as successful as they should be, is because this town is not nearly as friendly to black folks as it purports to be. I, as Juneteenth, there are festivals and commemorations all over San Francisco. When the organization I was the ED of, when we started Juneteenth back in 74, with about four cars and a parade, and we went over to Kimball Park and had a barbecue. The next year it got bigger and bigger and kept getting bigger. The reason we started back, because we're sitting around the office one day and say, you know, everybody got a parade and a day. Got Columbus Day Parade, the Italian, you got a Chinese New Year Parade, you got St. Patrick's Day, you got Cinco de Mayo. We ain't got nothing. Somebody said, well, we used to have Juneteenth. Wesley Johnson used to lead the parade on a white horse. And we said, let's start it back. And we've been doing it now since 74. And I am amazed at what happens. And that is because I look at entities, philanthropists and corporate entities that give those other parades I just mentioned, 40 and 50 and $100,000 for their parade. And the same people turn around and give us $3,000 and, and stick their chest out like they really did something. And so uh, I, 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 would, I would like people to know that Juneteenth, even in its hey heyday, during the largest Juneteenth that have ever been held in this town, thousands and thousands and thousands of people on Fillmore Street, people coming from out of town, because at that time it was a Juneteenth weekend, you would not believe what the people of this community put Juneteenth on for. You would not believe the small amount of money. But one of the things you have to know, and this is why it's important that black folks need an economic base. When we started that in 74, and as it grew, we didn't get money from the city, we didn't ask for it. We didn't get money from corporate donors, except that Juneteenth was supported by the black merchants in Fillmore. The insurance companies, the stores, the shops, all the, the black contractors would come out and help us build our booths. It was a black event, and, it were, and that's why we could do what we wanted to do, because couldn't nobody tell us 
uh, could threaten, uh, threaten us by taking, say they're going to take out the money because they didn't have no money in it. One of the uh, most important cogs within this struggle uh, in the Fillmore and trying to maintain and uh, advance black presence was our KPOO radio. Uh, uh, in about 1974, it was brought to the attention of some of us in the community that there was a radio station, uh, uh, Poor People's Radio Incorporated, that was available. Uh, we went to talk to the people who uh, owned it and ran it at that time and talked about the importance of having a uh, black presence on that station. Uh, one thing led to another within the conversation and we ended up owning the station that became the first black owned educational radio station west of the Mississippi, St. Louis River that wasn't owned by a um, uh, 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 educational institution. And uh, that was in 74. And so throughout all of the issues that occurred for black folk in San Francisco, KPOO was in the middle of it. Whether it was the events that were going on in the, uh, uh, in, in the community, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I remember uh, KPOO did a two-day symposium with uh, many activists in the community, and it was when gay folks first started to really move into the Fillmore. There were, we held a forum for two days of people talking about working together and advancing the experience of both communities, and it was called uh, Gays in the Fillmore, Conflict or Cooperation. And you name them, people who were important to both communities were in those discussions. And, and it was some more wonderful stuff that went on. Uh, when the SLA uh, kidnapped the heiress, Patty Hearst, and when they decided they want to get, wanted to get out information to the uh, black community, they found ways to get their communiques in the hands of KPOO radio so that we could put out the information that they wanted the community to have. And on and on, you look at everything that went down that was important for people since 1974. You got to remember, there wasn't no internet at that time. When people wanted information about their community, the kind of news about the black community, for example, or any poor community that uh, the news media wasn't going to cover, KPOO put the word out. I'll never forget once there was a, a major fire in the Mission District. And one of our people, KPOO people, happened to be walking by. And they saw these people going to be put out of their homes. And they got on the phone and called the station and did a live on the spot report. In the course of it, a family came up that had been burned out, didn't know what they were going to do. One of their family members heard them uh, on, on the radio, called up and said, tell them so-and-so call and to call me and because they can stay with me until they get a place. And so we immediately called our person who was on the scene. And, and, we're, and those were the kinds of things uh, I'll never forget. There was a robbery at a big supermarket, uh, uh, and uh, they caught a couple of the people and put them in the back of the wagon. So the cops came over and talked to all the reporters. And I was there with my KPOO press pass on. And when they were, the cops was interviewing them, uh, a couple of them asked me, what's KPOO? I didn't answer him because just at that time, one of the fellas that had been arrested in the back of the truck started hollering, Arno, Arno. And I said, that's what KPOO is. Y'all know the cops, we know the robbers because they're from the community. And so we were able to tell the whole story because of, of, of those kinds of things things and those kinds of activity. So it, 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 was, uh, it has been and still is such an important presence. I can tell you that at one time, every major network in the United States, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, had somebody of color that KPOO trained uh, working for them. Uh, others, we had people that we trained all over the country becoming general managers 
a radio station before, uh, you know, the change in Washington, D.C. And, and the destabilization of radio and information started in this country. So one thing I want to tell everyone in the black community, and especially you younger folk, if you're going to turn it around, the thing that you must do is organize, organize, organize. <laughs>